defining the edge module by just going ahead and briefly talking about some of the other enterprise edge submodules that we're going to have. One of the important ones, obviously, is the remote access submodule. You want to make sure that your network users will get seamless, transparent access to the network from wherever they are, just like they're sitting on the actual network. I mean, that's really your goal. Uh, you want to be able to get you want to be able to get them to the resources that they're authorized to use and the resources they need. You want them to be able to access those resources like they are sitting right there inside the enterprise campus. So we really need to look at their connection requirements and make sure we can fulfill them. Are they going to need voice over IP over these connections? Are they going to need VPN? If they're going to need VPN, is it a secured VPN that they require? Are they going to have a lot of high volume traffic or low volume traffic? Do they, is it sufficient that they circuit switch? In other words, dial up and then tear down that connection? Or do they need to have a permanent, always on connection to the network? These are all questions that we want to ask ourselves as we are designing the remote access network block for these remote access individuals in our organization. Remember, when we talk about VPN designs, we don't always indicate that these have to be secure. I mean, an example would be frame relay. Frame relay is a virtual private network, but it might not necessarily have any sophisticated security on top of it. It's you communicating, we hope, privately between two uh, locations. So you're using service provider equipment that's servicing a whole bunch of different customers, and you're using it privately for your own network means, but it doesn't necessarily have to have high degrees of security to it. Whether or not we add security to virtual private networking depends on how much security is an emphasis in our particular enterprise designs. So very, very interesting that when we say VPN, most people think security, but that does not have to be the case. By the way, when it does come to VPN troubleshooting, we've really typically got our work cut out for us, and that's because we don't have visibility into what's going on in the provider. You often see, of course, the provider represented as like a cloud. Okay, so we have our particular sites that we are connecting. And the provider is represented as this cloud, and that's very uh, a very specific representation because we don't know what's going on inside that cloud. We don't know the specific technologies that are used in that cloud. We don't know the topologies. We don't know the specifics of what goes on in there. And that's why when we're troubleshooting VPN networks, we got to really focus on what we can control and make sure that's not the problem. And then once we isolate it to being a problem in the cloud, then we can go ahead and contact the service provider. Notice there are many different types of VPN technologies. There are VPNs that are designed for remote access. Sometimes we have uh, an example of this would be the virtual private dial-up network. So it is a dial-up situation for the remote access, but it is done with typically security in the VPDN design. We might have intranet, also known as site-to-site -site VPNs. This is where we want to connect different locations over a secure connection over the public infrastructure. Two often types, uh, often used intranet types are called the overlay and the peer-to-peer -peer model. An overlay would be something like frame relay, 
where a peer-to-peer -peer would be something like MPLS. In the peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure, we can go ahead and communicate seamlessly between our sites, and we can, uh, in an MPLS design, as we saw, we don't have to worry about like IP address space overlap and things of that nature. What if we want to connect with a virtual private network to partner companies? Well, this is what we call an extranet VPN. Maybe we have several key partners, business partners out there in the world. We want to go ahead and transfer information with them to maintain our competitiveness. And in this case, we organize into an extranet VPN design. By the way, when we do VPNs, we are often tunneling traffic. We are often tunneling traffic in order to send it over an infrastructure. There is a tunneling methodology for layer three invented by Cisco called generic routing encapsulation. GRE allows you to encapsulate or tunnel traffic inside this GRE mechanism but it does not provide security. The suite of technologies that would allow you to tunnel traffic and provide security is called IPSEC, short for IP security. This is a mandatory implementation component of IPv6. In IPv6, you absolutely have to support IP security in order to be an authorized like IPv6 device. So this is very much the future of our VPNs, this IPsec, but we can also use it, of course, for IPv4 also. But it's not a requirement for IPv4 environments. By the way, IPsec allows us to get those triple A parameters of authorization, authentication, and accounting. So we can track who people are, what people are trying to do, and for how long they've done it using the IPsec suite of technologies. When you're designing VPNs, you certainly want them to be flexible, and you want them to be cost effective for your infrastructures. These are main benefits of VPNs, by the way. I mean, we love that MPLS VPNs allow us to be so flexible in their utilization. We love that virtual private networking can use the internet and secure our traffic over the internet, so it's a very low cost way in which to connect sites to other sites. And of course, these add to the scalability benefits where we can just continue to add more and more sites via the secured VPN. Something else we wanted to emphasize as we wrap up Module 4, we talked a bit about backup, but I want to formalize that discussion by telling you there are three main approaches to WAN backups. There's a dial-up backup approach like we talked about. So you might only have circuit switching in your environment for backup purposes. No other circuit switching might exist now. So you have this permanent always-on connection, and then if something happens to that, that's when you kick in your circuit switched dial backup. Pretty cool idea. Or, as I alluded to earlier in the course, we may create a secondary WAN link. Notice that the secondary WAN link, its primary job can be backup in case of a failure of the primary, but it can also be load balanced against as well. So our most common two options are definitely dial backup and secondary WAN link. You may have heard of a rare third option called a shadow PVC. This is when the service provider establishes a second permanent virtual circuit for you, but they only charge you for its usage. We call it a shadow PVC, and obviously one of the cases in which you might use it is you have a failure of your main PVC. Sometimes companies will use the shadow PVC for bandwidth overflow. So they'll say, okay, well, we're going to use the shadow PVC if we lose our primary PVC or if we just have some more information to send. Again, the beauty of the shadow PVC 
is typically the service provider will only charge you for it for actual usage. And then we have to consider branch modules in our Enterprise Edge design. Branch modules are going to be from the very smallest, like the Enterprise Teleworker, often referred to as a branch of one, or all the way up to multi-tier designs that could accommodate up to a thousand users. In the multi-tier design, we literally have like access layer equipment, distribution layer equipment, core layer equipment out at the branch office to satisfy all of those many users. Notice a dual tier branch office typically runs about 100 users, where a single tier branch office typically runs about 50. So one of the things that we want to do when designing these enterprise branches is obviously look at the number of users that branch office environment needs to accommodate, and that could be from the single user on up to a thousand or more users. Well, folks, I certainly hope you had as much fun here in Module 4 as I did talking about wide area networking technologies. We'd like to wrap it up with one final review question. We have an important branch office location that needs WAN backup to headquarters. What two options might you suggest? Well, we know there are three options here that we discussed for WAN backup. There's the dial-up backup approach. There's a secondary WAN link. And then there's the shadow PVC. I would say the dial-up or the second WAN link, those are going to be the two most popular approaches. And these would be the two that we would recommend right off the bat. I want you to certainly know about the shadow PVC or I wouldn't have covered it with you, but it is certainly not a typical kind of, you know, typical technology that we would mention here as part of the CCDA exam.